Baba ran before I did. Um, actually, I, I decided to run for the state legislature, which really began my desire to go into the federal level. And that was back in the 70s. And it was in the 70s when uh, the Equal Rights Amendment was traveling through Congress. Martha Griffith had introduced it. And it was a, a time when commissions for women were being established in the country. And I was on the first commission for women in Montgomery County. And as I looked around at the inequities, I pushed very hard to get our state legislature to uh, support the Equal Rights Amendment, and they did. And, and um, it didn't, however, make it to the requisite number of states, but maybe in the future we will, we will finally get that Equal Rights Amendment. But I saw the inequities and I thought, you know, if I wanted a credit card, I had to have my husband sign for me and Bob or I know can, can uh, agree with that kind of thing. So I thought, you know, if you don't have a seat at the table, you might be on the menu, but there's a better, you know, and I thought about that, there's a better phrase from Sir Shirley Chisholm when she said, if you don't have a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. So I decided to run for the state legislature. I served there for eight years. I went into Congress in 1986. So frankly, to, answer your question briefly, it was the women's movement that put the movement into me. I uh, grew up in a political family and uh, I married a, a, a man that was in politics. So I, I really hadn't thought it was gonna be me. But you know, when you're around the business and, and you get involved in the business, it, it becomes very important on what your government is and what it can do. And so I was on the city council and I loved it. I was in charge of, of, of the fire department. <laughs> Every time the alarm went off, when the children were in the car, we'd go find, find the fire. But anyway, I was a, a city councilwoman, and then uh, I was uh, a secretary of the state. And uh, I loved that job. I loved going around the state, encouraging people to register to vote and just encouraging the whole system to work right. And, and then I had... Uh, the person that was the congressman, Congressman Cotter, uh, was our, our congressman in our district, and he died. And uh, I decided uh, to run for his seat, and I, I ran for his seat, and I won, and I was a very happy individual as a member of Congress. Wonderful. <laughs> and I think Connie will agree, we both enjoyed the experience and we worked very, very hard and uh, we, we worked to have more women come to Congress. I, I absolutely, I, I had younger children, my children weren't that young, my son was, but uh, I enjoyed being a member of Congress. I came home every weekend because my husband never had any interest in going to Washington and uh, I I, I, when you first, Connie will tell you, when you first uh, come to Congress, you get appointed to a nice committees, but not relative. And uh, I, I knew if I was leaving Hartford and going home every weekend, I wanted to be an important committee. And so I went, I worked very hard to get on Ways and Means and uh, Tip O'Neill helped me. Uh, as, as for me, I, in 86, uh, when I when I won and it was the hundredth Congress. Incidentally, as an aside, it was a Congress which elected Nancy Pelosi a few months later because she had started it with an appointment and John Lewis, Amo Houghton, Fred Upton. So we had a lot of very key people that were in that one hundredth Congress. There were like twenty four women in the House, and it was almost evenly divided, Democrat Republican. And so we were such a minority. There was a, a room that was just off of Statuary Hall, which we call the Congresswoman's Reading Room, where we finally had a bathroom to ourselves, a place where we could uh, uh, rest, a place where we could converse. And an interesting story about that is that uh, we, named, we renamed that room the Lindy Boggs Room. Mm -hmm. and this was, I think, 1991, and I was there. Lindy Boggs went into the room for the dedication, and she looked up and saw the statue of John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams was in the state, was in the federal Congress after being president, and he had a heart attack in Statuary Hall, which is where Congress uh, uh, convened, 
and they took him into that room, that congresswoman's room, which became the Lindy Boggs room. And on the sofa, which they still have there, several days later, he died. So Lindy Boggs looks up at that statue and she says, well, John, your father didn't listen to your mother, Abigail. But I think now uh, Abigail would be pleased to know that you are here surrounded by strong women. And uh, I've always felt that that was really true. Few women, not enough, but when we were there and we talked to each other and we shared ideas and, and we got people to sign on to our bills and we would walk out of that room and Barbara can probably remember this and there'd be some uh, fellow members of Congress who see us and they say, they're thinking to themselves, what are they conspiring? What are they planning to do? So we did find that getting together and helping each other was critically important as a minority. But as a minority, because I know what it's like to be in a minority and a majority and a, ma and a minority and a minority, but, um, but as, a, as a minority, I think you have to work harder. And I think the women that we serve with did show that they worked very hard, very persevered, did their homework. Well, I just hope that we, we continue to set that road <laughs> so that other women will travel it without any, any uh, sense of whether this is a male or a female. And I think both Barbara and I felt that way when we were elected is that it wasn't because we were women, but because we believe strongly in doing something with this coterie of, of political junkies, the former members who are all this wealth and this desire to help. Uh, so I, I was honored. I didn't quite think about it as being a woman and delighted to have my buddy, uh, Barbara, uh, be there uh, following me. And I hope that there'll be many more women that will be presidents. Well, I, I think that's the delight of former members. Uh, it was no, really, as Connie says, it was no big deal that they had a woman president and then they had another woman president. I don't think it was even mentioned. Uh, we, we worked hard at what we did. We both went up the, uh, up the steps in, in uh, you know, treasurer, vice president, et cetera. But uh, former members is a wonderful organization. Uh, it, it keeps you involved, it keeps you active, and uh, I'll tell you, they do a very good job. I served in Congress, and we had eight members of the House and two of the Senate, and of the eight members of the House at one time, three of them were women, and we had our Senator, Barbara Mikulski. I, I hate to say this, but right now we have no women on a federal level from the state of Maryland who wow. are serving. And so something needs to be done about it. I will, re I will recollect that I served in the state legislature. And then when I was running for the federal legislature, I am the only, only woman in, in Maryland, in the state of Maryland, that ever went successfully from the state legislature to the federal Congress. And I've thought about that, sadly. I thought, why? And then I realized what happens is that the males get their friends and get their allies and they jump in right away and so there's no room in a primary for a woman so the women get kind of pushed aside what i did when i ran that first time is i decided early on before any other republican got into the race that this is what i was going to do and i really think um getting uh, allies and supporters with issues early on really help. So women, women need still have a way to go. They're making some great successes um, politically and in all ways, but I still think they have a way to go and they need to help each other. I was on that Ways and Means Committee and I just loved it, but I noticed there had never been a woman on the Intelligence Committee. So once again, I went to Tip O'Neill and I said, Tip, there's no woman has ever been on the Intelligence Committee, and that's a very important committee. And he said, Barbara, are you never satisfied? So when Jim Wright became chair, uh, became speaker, I went to him and I said, I think it's just wrong that there's not a woman on the Intelligence Committee. And he appointed me. And I, I have to tell you something. I loved every minute of it. It was fascinating, uh, I, but I did see the world and I saw the the problems in the world and how lucky we were in the United States of America. 
And I think you can get from listening to the two of us. We were very happy in our jobs and we love working hard. <laughs> oh, well, Barbara, you had a good point when you said you commented on speaking out. If you want something, ask for it. You know. <laughs> That's right. They can only say no. <laughs> exactly right, and yet you've all you gained that step too. That's right. Women very often will say, "Oh, I don't know. Maybe I'm not prepared." Baloney. Go ask for it, and you get it. <laughs>